Thanks for coming out. Um, have any folks here been to any of my previous talks? Oh, you have, okay. So I apologize if I repeat some of what I've talked about, but there's been such an outbreak of anti-Semitism, new anti-Semitic incidents and new topics to talk about. So a lot of what I'm gonna cover is actually new. But I do wanna go into some of the sociology of anti-Semitism in Europe, which you may have heard in one of my talks. Um, I'm gonna cover um, what's unfolded in terms of Europe. I'll probably concentrate mainly on Germany and Austria, um, but I, I will expand on, into other countries on the continent. Um, the UK, I'm not gonna deal with as much, um, probably just touch on it. So that, that's gonna, I'm gonna cover, um, as I mentioned, the sociology, one form of anti-Semitism that I, that I don't think has been addressed it's called guilt defensiveness anti-Semitism. Then I'm gonna delve into Germany's, uh, how Germany's dealing with anti-Semitism and Iran, and um, anti-Semitism in the academy, some of the countervailing forces against BDS and anti-Semitism. There have been some, I know this will shock this audience, but there have actually been some efforts that have succeeded in countering uh, anti-Semitism uh, on college campuses in Europe including uh, anti-BDS resolutions. And then I will, um, we can open up to questions about um, what I've discussed. I will also focus on how um, anti-Semitism, the interplay between eliminatory anti-Semitism or lethal anti-Semitism and uh, terrorism, um, whether it's um, Islamic animated terrorism, for example, Hezbollah, which is present in Europe, or secular Palestinian terrorist, terrorism like the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. So let me start just with an article in the New York Post, ex-NYPD police chief on how to fight surge in anti-Semitic crimes, written by Raymond Kelly and two other intelligence officials with the New York City Police Department. Kelly, of course, I assume everyone knows, was the former chief of police, very distinguished uh, police officer and counterterrorism expert. What have we learned? They did a tour of Europe, so I think this was relevant. Extreme left-wing progressive anti-Zionism that at a practical level often bleeds into anti-Semitism sees the U see the UK's potential next Prime Minister Jeremy Corbyn. And then he lists far-right anti-Semitism, neo-Nazism, the rise of the AFD, and then further down, they talk about uh, anti-Semitism from Muslim communities. So, you know, in an abbreviated version for a, you know, for a New York City Daily, they tried to cover um, what their experiences were in Europe and, and what they learned and, and these types of anti-Semitism. My objection to this um, analysis is um, extreme left-wing progressive anti-Semitism that as a practical level often bleeds into anti-Semitism. So the, the, the premise here is that one can make the distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, um, which shows, unfortunately, there's not um, a, a common definition, I should say, in terms of what, an, what constitutes anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism, from my perspective, is now identical with anti-Semitism. Um, Professor Robert Wistrich, who is uh, the head of the Vidal Sassoon Center of um, anti-Semitism studies at the Hebrew University. He died recently and was widely considered the leading scholar on anti-Semitism, argued that after World War II, after the Shoah, um, anti-Zionism can only be understood as anti-Semitism. That one could make the argument prior to the establishment of the State of Israel that anti-Zionism anti was not anti-Semitism, but given that the, the, the end result of anti-Zionism is the obliteration of the Jewish state and over six million Jews. Um, it's hard not to uh, interpret or read into anti-Zionism as anything other than uh, an anti-Semitic uh, contention. So that's my objection to this sort of reading of what's happening in Europe. What, what they didn't comment on, and I think this is a problem not only in the United States in terms of trying to understand European anti-Semitism, but also in Europe. Um, and this theory goes back to um, Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno, two German um, Marxist philosophers, sort of master thinkers because of their 
con contribution to um, philosophy, both before the show and after. Um, they were actually work for this organization, not ISCAP, but for the American Jewish Committee, which I believe owns this building or is lodged here um, in, the, in the 1940s and, and did some research work for the American Jewish Committee. They, after they fled uh, Nazi-occupied uh, Europe, they uh, lived in the United States and then both men returned to Germany. And they developed this theory um, m mainly as sort of a, a sociological theory of guilt defensiveness anti-Semitism. That, that uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm engaging in sweeping generalizations here, so put scary quotes on a lot of the things I'm saying because we don't have a lot of time. But that basically means that how Germans responded to the Holocaust after 1945. This notion that um, the response to the Holocaust produced anti-Semitism. In short, that Germans were filled with a sense of, uh, again, I'm, 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 I'm generalizing here, but many Germans, large swaths of the population, were filled with a sense of pathological guilt about the crimes of the Holocaust. I'm not talking just about the perpetrators, I'm talking about future generations. Um, you know, it could even be the, the children of the perpetrators, the, um, the grandchildren. But this notion that one is filled with guilt about the crimes of the National Socialist, whether their parents were involved or grandparents or great-grandparents, given the, the generational shift, produced this sense of guilt. And how does one want purge guilt? Um, the theory um, is to blame Jews. And that's why Adorno and Horkheimer, in writing in the late 40s and then continuing with their writings into the 60s, um, described the, the German reaction as a way to blame uh, Jews. Now, as, as human history moved forward, um, blaming Jews after the Holocaust was not politically and socially correct. So what's happened is a shift where Israel has now become a substitute for the Jew and as a, French, a famous French historian said, Israel is now the, 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 the Jew among the nations, which I'm sure many of you heard this famous quote from a French Jewish historian. Um, and that's presented a whole new anti-Semitic dynamic and, and, and really force a, a sort of a Tusami wave of anti-Semitism because you have, and, and I would argue this applies, this type of guilt defensiveness anti-Semitism applies mainly to Western Europe. I haven't seen it as ubiquitous in Eastern Europe, but my experiences in Europe, in France, in Italy, um, the, the, the Scandinavian countries like Norway and, and that were complicit with the National Socialists, et cetera, et cetera, um, there's this sense now, well, we can't single out individual Jews, but we will turn Israel into a human punch bag in order to purge our guilt about the crimes of the, Nash, of the Hitler movement. Now, this may sound like a lot of sort of uh, kitchen sink psychology, but I haven't found a more compelling or plausible explanation for why Europe is intensely preoccupied with Israel. As we saw recently, there were scores of resolutions at the UN uh, castigating Israel, uh, Germany, Austria, all of Western Europe again uh, joined uh, countries like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Iran, in passing resolutions against Israel. Israel is the most sanctioned country at the UN. It, it, it's well above any of these uh, countries that commit real atrocities. Um, and then, of course, the European media, if you, if you immerse yourself in it, um, resolutions in European parliaments, nation-state parliaments, but also the, the European parliament are largely um, obsessed with Israel, I would argue pathologically obsessed at times. Um, and the question then is, how do you explain this intense preoccupation with Israel, the Jewish state? Why is there... We just saw the, the recent example, I'm sure folks have followed it with Airbnb, right? Um, and how does it, one explain the Airbnb example as opposed to Airbnb and other areas of the world where there are territorial disputes that Airbnb has not uh, taken action against? Um, there's a word for it, it starts with an A, um, anti-Semitism, and it's based on disparate treatment or discrimination. Um, that's sort of when you strip anti-Semitism down to its core meaning, as, as the late Charles Krauthammer, the distinguished columnist for the Washington Post, um, once said, wrote that anti-Semitism is just discrimination against Jews. Um, you know, I would argue that you know, within the European context, but also in the American context, the one of the core components of anti-Semitism 
is um, the eliminatory quality. That means in, in contrast to other forms of discrimination, whether it's sexism, racism, homophobia, um, anti-Semitism at its core involves a lethal streak that wants to dissolve Jews. And we saw that happen in Pittsburgh. And that's why anti-Semitism is so distinct. It, it separates itself from these other forms of discrimination. Um, and I don't think um, the efforts to conflate anti-Semitism with racism and other form, all these other isms is justified as we, we commonly see, I think, in this country, excuse me, because of the, um, the extreme nature of, of identity politics and multiculturalism that's gone to its extreme. I'm not against multiculturalism or identity politics, but I do think it's, it's, it's a dangerous situation when anti-Semitism, given what's happened in Europe in light of what's happened in Pittsburgh, is somehow loses its, its meaning and the, and the destructive streak associated with it, with it and where it can lead. Um, so again, I, I can't overstress, overemphasize enough the eliminatory quality of, of anti-Semitism and how that differentiates in, from the other forms of discrimination. So my um, theory now is not really a theory, it's just an adding another layer, I, I suppose, to what Adorno and Horkheimer said is the, the, the idea that Germans or, and others are responding to the Holocaust by bashing Israel as a way of, you know, cleansing themselves of their guilt is a form of anti-Semitism. I would now argue that what you have is um, a new version of what uh, Zivi Rex, a famous Israeli psychoanalyst called, um, who, who, the psychoanalyst in the 80s basically summed up Adorno and Horkheimer because when you try to read them, it's largely un unintelligible at times because their philosophy is so dense. Um, and I know very few people who really understand it. Um, if you can garner some of the meaning, it's a success. But Zivi Rex, this Israeli psychoanalyst, said, um, the Germans will never forgive the Jews for Auschwitz. Right? He meant that with sarcasm and, and biting humor. What I think is unfolding right now is the Western Europeans largely um, will never forgive the Israelis for the Holocaust. Um, I don't, again, I don't know of any other plausible or compelling explanation out there that provides evidence as to why there's such an intense infatuation with Israel and um, examining every single move that's taking place in the state of Israel as opposed to other countries. Um, and again, it's mainly coming from um, the EU. One example I think that, that per perhaps adds fuel to the fire uh, the anti-Semitic fire in terms of why Israel's preoccupied with, um, uh, why Europe is preoccupied with Israel is the recent um, demarcation of Israeli products from the disputed territories of Judea and Samaria and the Golan Heights and East Jerusalem. In 2015, the EU passed a resolution to label Israeli products, right? Um, which is, in my view, another version, a modernized version of don't buy from Jews from the, right. Uh, they won't call it BDS, but they put a label on Israeli products, similar to what Airbnb just did, but this label only applied to one territorial dispute, Israel. The EU was very zealous about passing that. The German Green Party, um, I should note, passed a similar resolution in 2013 in the Bundestag. And the German Green Party is a very powerful party in Germany. Um, they're, they're gaining votes. They have a coalition government in the, east, in the southwestern state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, with Merkel's party. So the Greens and the conservative Christian Democratic Union have formed coalition. Germany has 16 states, and a number of the states, or at least in this state, we see a coalition. Um, and they may very well be in the next government. The German Greens in 2013 passed an initiative in the Bundestag calling for or urging a labeling of Israeli products. Um, when I did some homework on this topic, I found that the neo Nazi party in Germany, the MPD, um, it's a small neo-Nazi party that's maybe in some state parliaments now, um, but it's, it's not insignificant, but it's not, it's not a major threat to, the, to Germany's democracy. Uh, the MPD in, in a state parliament in, the, in eastern Germany uh, passed a resolution a year before the Greens that called for the uh, punitive measures against Israeli products, 
labeling system. It was based, and the Greens adopted this resolution. It was almost the same language, and I called up the Green Party, and I wrote them, and I said, how do you explain this? Did you guys, you know, did you folks sort of steal the neo-Nazi uh, language and use it for their own? And the, and the Green Party uh, spokesman got all bent out of shape, and, you know, how dare you say that, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, I queried him over and over, have you, have you, have you initiated any other resolutions to penalize any other countries involved in territorial disputes? No, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that anti-Semitism? You know, um, no, of course not, of course not. So, you know, th these are the types of conversations, you know, you have with many Europeans on, on this matter. This week I reported that in the Jerusalem Post, um, I got a nice exclusive. I, I'm, I'm showing off a bit, but it happens every once in a while, and it's, it's worth noting. Um, a source, a Western source, told me that Chancellor Merkel worked overtime to convince the Romania's president not to relocate yeah, its embassy to uh, Jerusalem. And I was told that um, by this source, it's believed that Merkel also er campaigned in Europe to convince other European politicians. So this is interesting because if you go back 10 years, when Merkel delivered her famous Knesset speech in Israel, she declared Israel's security to be non-negotiable, right? With put, these are the words she used, and that Israel's security is part of the national interests of Germany. So that, that sets a very high standard in terms of recognizing uh, the security of interest and, and, and going to great lengths to protect it. But at the same time, um, Israel's priority is to, you know, to declare that it's, decide what, which, which, which city is its capital, as every country can decide, and Germany is working overtime to prevent that. It's, it's unsettling because this, this idea of, of not allowing Israel to decide what its capital is or where it's located plays into the delegitimacy of Israel and strips Israel of its authenticity and its, 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 its existence. So it, it gets into the whole BDS stuff when you start talking about delegitimization, which I considered actually to be the most um, deadly part of BDS in many ways. Um, the economic damage to Israel has been limited and contained, uh, but it still needs to be observed and, and, and countered. But the, the attacks on Israel's authenticity as a, as a Jewish state, on its, on, its, on its sheer existence, and the efforts to strip Israel of its identity and, its, and dismantle its, its existence through this delegitimization, through the efforts by Merkel, for example, to block countries from moving their embassies to Jerusalem, that's a serious problem. Um, when I, just by way of background, when I contacted the Romanian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they declined to comment. They punted me over to the president. The president declined to comment. The Germans declined to comment. They said, you know, we're working for a two-state solution. They did not don deny the report, and the Israelis did not deny the report. They, they declined to comment, or the, the, the embassy in Berlin. Um, at the same time that this happened, as I mentioned, Germany was working overtime with its European counterpart to uh, join um, the jackals at the UN and um, sanction Israel with this series of resolutions. Austria's Sebastian Kurz, many of you may know, a new, relatively new chancellor, very young, um, has declared, similar to Merkel, that Austria's national security interests encompass Israel's national security interests. And to his credit, he's made progress, but he joined the jackals too at the UN. So it's somewhat inexplicable. Both countries also, Austria and Germany, that have declared Israel's security interests to be identical with their security interests, refuse to join US sanctions against Iran. This leads me into Iran, which, um, as folks know, is the, um, according to the US State Department, the top state sponsor, or top international sponsor state sponsor of terrorism, but also lethal anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. So that's the Iranian regime. Um, Germany's um, has a very um, ugly romance with um, Iran. I'll just put up an article I wrote here in Tablet. Um, you know, I delve into why Germany seeks to increase trade with a murderous theocracy bent on Israel's destruction. This is sort of the the topic that dare not speak its name in Germany, this, um, this refusal by Germany to uh, join 
U.S. sanctions against Iran. Now, just to lay out the, I guess, the disconnects, as I would call them, on the one hand, we have this, what, Merkel's speech in the Knesset. On the other hand, we have Merkel showing up as part of a joint cabinet meeting in a consultation meeting in October in Israel. The German cabinet and the Israeli cabinet met. They have these annual consultation meetings. Um, Merkel reportedly uh, skipped the last one or called it off because she was um, upset with uh, the uh, settlement, the, pol the settlement policies. Um, at, thi at this meeting, uh, President Rivlin, Reuven Rivlin, urged Merkel to join U.S. sanctions ag against Iran. She rebuffed him. Her foreign minister, uh, Heiko Maas, a social democrat, the current German government is made up of the conservatives, um, a Bavarian conservative party, Merkel's party, the Christian um, Democratic Union and the uh, Social Democrats who are dropping in the polls everywhere. Her foreign minister, Heiko Maas, declared earlier this year when he was appointed the new foreign minister that he went into politics because of Auschwitz. That's his language. He went into politics because of Auschwitz. Meanwhile, Heiko Maas um, is working like Merkel overtime to bust the U.S. sanctions against Iran, the top state sponsor of lethal anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. The U.S. government is trying to um, stop the Europeans from evading their sanctions since they went into effect on November 5th, 6th. Um, and there's a special purpose vehicle that the Europeans want to create that will allow the Iranians and the Europeans to trade. They want to bypass the sanctions, the Europeans, and insulate European companies against American sanctions. So Moss is working to set up this a new system. Uh, he, went, he went as far as to try to bypass SWIFT. Do folks know what SWIFT is? This international banking system in Brussels that allows for cross-national payments. For example, if you want to transfer funds to Israel, you need that SWIFT code and you can transfer funds. Um, that's very important for Iranian banks. If you can disconnect all the Iranian financial institutions, as the Europeans and the Americans did last term or back in 2012, you can, br at that many consider help bring the Iranians to the negotiating table. And the Americans have helped right now under the Treasury Secretary. He's helped, he's convinced some of the, the Brussels headquarters of SWIFT to disconnect, for example, the Central Bank of Iran. Very important because, again, all of this, how does this, how does this lead into, to get back to anti-Semitism? All this funding, right? It, it allows Iran to fund its, its export of anti-Semitism. Um, when they have this type of money. So if you can dry up the funding streams, it, it helps curtail some of the anti-Semitism that Iran exports um, to around the world or via uh, attacks. For example, um, folks have probably read in the media recently, I Iranian uh, intelligence agencies plotted to assassinate Iranian dissidents in Paris where um, R former Mayor Rudy Rudolph Giuliani spoke and others. Uh, Bolton, the National Security Advisor, John, Bol John Bolton, has spoke at this event in the past. And in Denmark, there was another plot recently where Iranians were caught. And of course, Burgess in 2012, where Hezbollah, an Iranian proxy that receives 700 to $1 billion a year in funding from Iran, the Lebanese Shiite militia, um, blew up an Israeli tour bus, killed five Israelis in Burgas, Bulgaria, a seaside resort, and murdered their um, Bulgarian Muslim bus driver. 32 additional Israelis were injured. It's a, a clear-cut case not only of terrorism, but lethal anti-Semitism. So that's the type of funding um, that, that the Europeans are continuing to boost instead of, boost in the sense of they don't want to curtail the funding. They're actually trying to to um, dismantle U.S. sanctions, and it's all very unsettling from the perspective of folks who want to combat anti-Semitism and terrorism. Okay, let me show the videos. Um, I'm going to sit and speak up. If that works, tell me if I'm not, if I'm speaking not speaking loud enough. Let me know. Okay, the first video is I'm going back to the embassy discussion. I should have showed this video at that point. This is what took place in Berlin when the Trump administration announced it was going to move its embassy to Jerusalem. This is for the Brandenburger tour.
thousand people were at this rally in front of the American Embassy. During the rally, they burned uh, Israeli Stars of David and the American flag. Showed flags of uh, Fatah and other Islamic organizations. Death to Israel, child murderer Israel, those were the slogans that were used. Berlin police then ended the assembly and arrested one participant. See the Turkish flags, which is very interesting. So what, what, what's interesting, I thought about that video, I mean, aside from these, these mass rallies that, that, that turn out large uh, numbers of, um, turn out large numbers of, of, of uh, times Germans, but this was, it looked like mainly German Muslims, is um, I haven't seen these types of rallies when it comes to the over 500,000 people that have been murdered by Assad, um, Putin, Hezbollah, and, and Iran and Syria. Or I haven't seen these types of rallies when, for example, uh, mass uh, gas attacks take place. Um, so again, it's interesting to, to notice these disconnects and how to explain them. Um, the other thing that was interesting I thought was the Turkish flags because it shows that Erdogan has also whipped up a level of anti-Semitic um, mania in Germany since his election in what was it, 2003, I believe he was elected. I've noticed that as someone who, who follows um, Turkish anti-Semitism and Turkish nationalism, um, that the, the increase, again, this is anecdotal. When I go to these rallies, I see increased numbers of, of German Turks and Turks there um, and at, at these um, mass, really, anti-Semitic rallies. Um, that didn't take place before Erdogan was in power. I was told by Germans who, who've lived in Germany and have you know, observed um, anti-Israeli marches. Now I just <clears throat> want to show, let's see, so this was a BDS event in October. This event took place at a cinema in East Berlin involving a Holocaust film festival that was sponsored by the Israeli uh, government. No culture in whitewashing apartheid. Interesting, the audience is booing them. This is our the German audience. <laughs> BDS bullshit der Spitzenklasse. Well, this is interesting. Let's see. Okay, there are. Someone just swore at them in German. Um, so, we have an interesting response here. The audience is clapping that they were removed. Um, um, so, you can see that it's, it's from the perspective of this being a nonviolent movement and uh, not wanting to uh, um, have nothing to do with uh, anti Semitism or playing down the Holocaust or watering it down, these episodes certainly show the contrary because the, the trespassing incident allegedly involved um, some type of assault. There was an assault charge that played out. And what's interesting is the Berlin Intelligence Agency, which is roughly the equivalent of the FBI without the same police powers, issued an intelligence report this year that said uh, the incident that took place at the Humboldt University last year was an expression of anti-Semitism. Um, so they did, you have now in Germany this year which is kind of remarkable when you think about it, um, because I don't think in the United States we have intelligence agencies or the State Department declaring BDS to be anti-Semitic. You have three agencies, state intelligence agencies in Germany that have written in their reports, it's in German, I translated the reports or the sections that are relevant to BDS and uh, wrote about them for different publications, including in The Hill. So in some way, um, one can argue, and I made this argument with a colleague of mine from Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, you can make the comparison between Nazism and BDS. And that's where the Germans and German intelligence officials have done that. Um, there are neo-Nazi parties in Germany that support BDS. I mentioned one, the MPD. 
There's another one called The Third Way, um, which is a sort of a left-wing Nazi party, a uh, small party um, that promotes a lot of BDS. And I've written about this Nazi, this neo-Nazi party's connection with Hezbollah and Assad. They've traveled to Lebanon and Syria over the years to meet with um, um, officials. So um, you have these sorts of linkages uh, getting into the, the whole issue of, count of counterterrorism, as I mentioned, and how to approach BDS. The third way, this neo-Nazi party also uses PayPal to raise funds. I've written PayPal, excuse me, over the last week, emails asking them, um, in light of Pittsburgh, do they plan to take any action against this account? Haven't heard back from them. Um, they've, over the years, they've insisted they have a no, some type of no-hate policy, but they have not closed this account of the third way, this neo-Nazi organization, which is inexplicable to me because and it may have something to do with German law, but I, I find that also um, not um, believable um, because PayPal shut down this year five BDS accounts in France. Uh, um, some of my work involves exposing BDS organizations that are um, engaged in illicit terror finance, working with, as I mentioned, the PFLP. But in France, you have a very powerful anti-BDS law, or what's been interpreted to be an anti-BDS law. There's a piece of anti-discrimination legislation that bars discrimination based on national origin. The French have enforced that law. So if you find a BDS organization in France that uses a French bank or PayPal, and you notify the bank or the online payment service, generally they shut down the accounts. So that's what's happened. In the United States, it's probably be um, a protected free speech issue, but if you can show, obviously, terrorism issues, and that's what I've done with some accounts in Germany and Austria, where, for example, Laila Khaled has appeared and spoke at, um, I'm trying to think of the organization, it was an Austrian Muslim community organization in Vienna where she spoke a number of years ago. I found out they had an account with um, an Austrian bank, and because of the PFLP connection, she was, of course, involved with two hijackings in the late 60s, early 70s. And she's, she's a convicted terrorist. She's for PFLP is a US and EU designated terrorist organization. The Austrian bank, um, because they were mainly scared about the Americans again, um, and their, their access to the American market, that's what it usually comes down to in the end, um, closed the account. But there have been other cases of this where you can show um, these, the interplay between, the, the, in this case, the PFLP, which runs a big BDS operation, including in South Africa, and banks. Um, just a couple of quotes that I think are relevant um, that, I, that resonate with me over the years, and, and these quotes took place, one has to um, think about it. One quote is from the late 60s from Jean Amri, a Holocaust survivor, originally from um, Vienna, um, he's not very well known in the U.S., unfortunately, journalist, but one of the most piercing um, writers on anti-Semitism and also criticized Hannah Arendt for her theory about the banality of, of evil and that she played down the, the whole banality of evil. Um, he's a very complex figure, but the quote in this, and by the way, he's also a leftist, which is interesting, um, which folks also don't realize. But in the late 60s, he said, open quote, anti-Zionism contains anti-Semitism like a cloud contains rain, close quote. So again, this is going back over 50 years ago. So we're still discussing whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. He recognized it, you know, as a survivor of Auschwitz, you know, over 50 years ago, right after the Six-Day War, I suspect, when that new wave of anti-Semitism kicked in because the Israelis flexed their muscles and uh, you know, defeated the, the Arab world. Hans Meyer, um, also a leftist, a German Marxist literary theorist, um, who survived the Holocaust, I believe, in Switzerland, he said in his biography, and this was going back in the early 70s, wrote, open quote, whoever attacks Zionism, but by no means wishes to say anything against the Jews, is fooling himself and others. The state of Israel is a Jewish state. Whoever wants to destroy it, openly or through policies that can affect nothing else but such destruction is practicing the Jew hatred of yesterday and time immemorial, close quote. Again, this quote's almost 50 years old. Um, just two other things here I just want to point out, again, in terms of the disconnect, because I forgot this. 
Um, Ali Larajani, I just want to mention this as a footnote to my talk on um, the Iran section and the, the disconnect in Germany between these, these revolutionary phrases about fighting anti-Semitism, we must counter anti-Semitism, we stand with Israel, and you know, we have to catch it at, at, at its origin, um, and never again. We hear these t this type of you know, very flowery, passionate rhetoric. When Ali Larjani attended the Munich Security Con Conference in 2009, he, by the way, is the, the president of Iran's um, phony parliament, he denied the Holocaust. This was written about in Spiegel, I wrote about in the Wall Street Journal. It was written about in a number of publications. There was no investigation into his Holocaust denial. There was no outrage. Um, politicians calling for him to be arrested or prosecuted. Um, a year later, or a year before, excuse me, a year before in 2008, his brother, Mohammed Larajani, who's the head of Iran's sort of phony uh, human rights council, um, Larajani's family is a very big family in Iran. And they control many levers of power. Obviously, they're beholden to the Iran's supreme leader, Ali Khamenei. But in 2008, near the Holocaust Memorial, at an event held at the German Foreign Ministry, uh, Mohammed Larajani denied the Holocaust and called for Israel's destruction. Again, no investigation uh, from the state, the, the state prosecutor because of Holocaust denial. Um, the Foreign Ministry did not blast him. Politicians were indifferent, and civil society was largely indifferent. You know, I, wrote an article in a German paper about it, Die Welt and other publications, but that was only because of the, you know, because I was pushing and being somewhat of a public nuisance. Um, but um, at the same time that these gentlemen were denying the Holocaust, if folks remember Richard Williamson, who's a Catholic bishop, denied the Holocaust in Germany and was prosecuted, and he paid a fine. Um, and Merkel was so outraged about his Holocaust denial that she urged the Pope at that time to condemn Williamson. But Merkel has never urged um, the Supreme Leader of Iran to condemn Holocaust denial. So these are the disconnects that play out. Or she didn't go on record condemning the Larajani brothers for um, call, not only calling for the destruction of Israel, but denying the Holocaust on German soil. Again, it's illegal in Germany to deny the Holocaust. So. These are the questions that I, I, I've written about or tried to address in my piece in Tablet, tried to explain why. Um, it's, it's obviously it's, uh, it's a tough subject, but I think I will end there because, as I mentioned, good questions are better than good answers, and we can start the uh, Q&A session. And thanks for listening. Yeah, um, but it wasn't a question. It was, it was a, a statement that, that her uh, miracles... Um, immigration policy where she let in over a million, um, I think it was over a million, that's, uh, um, immigrants, refugees, migrants from, from mainly Muslim majority countries belies her, her, her effort to combat anti-Semitism. Um, what was the first part? The, the Obama, the Obama gave Iran, or, or as part of the Iran nuclear deal, Obama's administration agreed to um, give Provide Iran with 150 billion dollars, and that, and you know, Iran has enough finances. Uh, in terms of the, um, it, these are interesting questions about Merkel's decision to um, allow to open the borders. No one really knows why. In the end, um, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, speculation. One one I idea is what you addressed that um, this idea of um, you know wanting to uh, show that that one has. Uh, um, is one is completely out of the barbarism of the jungle and, and has, has completely um, um, made good in, in terms of what's happened during, during the show. And this is another, more evidence that we've re rehabilitated ourselves. Um, you know, I would say that you know, the, there, there's another form of anti-Semitism that I didn't address because I didn't have enough time um, that, that dovetails into this. There's an author... His name is um, Wolfgang Port. Wolfgang Port said in terms of anti-Semitism that one problem with Germany right now is, and you may see this with this, the, the absorption of refugees and migrants and immigrants, this notion of um, wanting to be um, holier than thou, in the sense that we know better. Um, and Wolfgang Port once described 
uh, Germany's relationship to Israel is one of in which Germany is now Israel's probation officer. And we want to ensure that you Israelis don't, uh, uh, are, are, don't fall back into any sort of form of uh, recidivism where you regress and, and, um, and that we need to somehow then punish you again. And it's a very weird dynamic because you have uh, the whole German remembrance culture, memory culture, serving as a as a way to allow one to get on his high, his to allow one to get on his or her high horse, and let the Israelis know we we've learned the lessons of two world wars. We can now tell you when you're transgressing, and we're going to serve as Port said as your probation officer, and what you went through to extend his idea. Um, during the Holocaust was, was sort of a, and I'm being a bit polemical here, but what you went through in, in, during the Holocaust was sort of a, a, a reform school and a form of cognitive behavioral therapy in the extermination and concentration camps. You should have learned your lessons too. And you see that, that form of anti-Semitism, not only in Germany, but you've seen that, I think, also in Britain, where, and in other countries where people will say, well, you know, you Jews should have learned your, should have learned your lessons you know, from, from World War II, and why are you replicating the policies of, you know, the, the Nazis? And that's when you get into that type of anti-Semitism. In terms of Obama and the, and the $150 billion, I, I completely agree. I was vehemently opposed to the Iran deal. I, I've spent um, over, in addition to writing about anti-Semitism, because it's so ubiquitous in Europe and you can't ignore it, um, it really, and as I said, it, it's, 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 the amount of anti-Semitism that I experienced since 2002 until the present just keeps mushrooming and mushrooming and mushrooming. And of course, then we've experienced the lethal anti-Semitic attacks in France and Belgium and Germany too, of course, to Christmas 2016, I believe, um, when the Tunisian refugee or migrant drove a tractor trailer into the Christmas market in Berlin and killed, I believe, 10 people, 11, right, including an Israeli woman. Took Merkel almost a year to visit the families. You know, they uh, complained in a public letter that she was ignoring their request to meet. Um, I wrote about this in the Jerusalem Post and, and showed, according to the families, showed zero empathy for what they went through, um, which was interesting. Um, next question. In terms of the occupation, I think it's important. You mentioned the occupation. I think it's important to stress that the occupation is not causing anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is causing anti-Semitism. Right. But, it, but it's important, I think, in, in that one have these types of arguments when discussing with your, you know, your, your fellow Jews or non-Jews um, in terms of what causes anti-Semitism. It's clearly not the settlement policies. It's clearly not the occupation. We know all of this in terms of Israeli history. And you have to point that out. Look, it's, 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 it's a very exasperating and difficult conversation to have with many Jews and non-Jews who don't understand the Middle East, um, especially because you, you, you expect more from Jews. I understand that. I, you know, I'm constantly in that, that situation in, 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 in Europe. Um, you almost have to have a, um, um, a bottomless level of patience, as I said at the outset of this talk, in terms of bringing these arguments having these very patient discussions, you're not going to be able to convince a person in one discussion. But, but when you walk away from that person, and this has been my experience, there's a lot whirling around that person's head. In terms of the unity question, um, you know, in the end, if you want to, in the United States, if you want to change policies, you know, electoral politics is the name of the game, right? Wasn't it Obama who said you know, elections have consequences? So Trump was elected, and he dismantled the Iran agreement. Whatever, you know, whatever, putting aside the, the politics of Trump, you know, that's what his constituency wanted. With elected politicians, again, it involves grassroots organizing. This is very um, hard work. As someone who used to work in the union movement in New York City here, I worked for a healthcare workers union, 1199 when I was young. Um, and I know, I know, but, but, but by the way, this is important because the American labor movement in 2006 was the first national labor movement to oppose BDS. They, I was in Germany at the time, and Stuart Applebaum from the Retail Wholesale Department Store Workers Union, who's a liberal Jewish gay Zionist, worked with me, and we got the German unions to issue an anti-BDS statement back in 2006. That was a year after BDS was declared. 
So you can do these things. I think that helped, maybe I'm showing off too much, but I think that helped sort of counter the anti-Israelism in Germany a bit when you have the head of the major German Union say, this is anti-Semitic, this reminds me of the 30s. But my point again is grassroots organizing in the end, and it's very grueling work because you have to sweat, you, have to, you lose a lot of sleep, you're, you're filled with stress, you're filled with painful amounts of anxiety, but that's the name of the game. Any, all the other stuff is important, but it's just icing on the cake. The real work in terms of defeating BDS, and folks just, we see this now happening in the U.S. because American Jews and other organizations, pro-Israel organizations, have recognized the danger, are doing more grassroots work on the campuses. Let me get to her question because I'm doing too much talking. I agree with you um, in terms of the semantics and how, how one defines what means, what pro-Israel means. But I think in general, the 90 plus percent of American Jewry who are pro-Israel, they don't want Israel to be dismantled. There may be disagreements, uh, uh, sharp disagreements over the, the disputed territories, but we're not talking about what I see in Europe where um, you, know, you have significant numbers of people, uh, large swaths of the population in Western Europe who have um, very radical views about Israel's existence. That, you know, it's, it's, there's a 180 degree difference between what's taking place in Europe right now, Western Europe again, and I think that's where you see Israel making some very smart moves. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu um, is, as folks have seen, he's very focused on India, China, these countries, um, Bahrain now, uh, Bahrain and Oman. Um, right, and I think that's a very, very clever and sophisticated foreign policy um, to his credit, um, and moving away from these Western European countries because of, um, as I said, because, uh, again, to be polemical, because they won't forgive the Israelis for the, the Holocaust. You know, you've got, we'll see whether there are new generations who will, because of education, who will um, break from their, from this, this widespread anti-Israeli ideology. We've seen cases of that. I should note, um, at a number of German, German universities, Gutenberg in Mainz, named after the famous printing press developer, uh, the Goethe University in Frankfurt, named after the famous German poet, and in Leipzig, uh, the student councils at these major universities, these are huge universities like the, I don't know, University of Michigan, or when I think of, when I watch these uh, sporting events at times, or um, voted to condemn BDS as being anti-Semitic. So they passed resolutions, one university passed a resolution and prevailed, Heidelberg, Germany's oldest university this year, but then they lost because there was some irregularity with the secrecy of the ballots. It's supposed to be an, a, a closed ballot, but um, maybe there'll be another vote there. The, the University of Vienna, two years ago, also passed a resolution, the students condemning BDS as anti-Semitic. I should note, at the University of Vienna, these were also socialist, communist, and Green Party students who voted to condemn BDS as anti-Semitic. There have been some very interesting developments among youth organizations in Germany from these political parties that view BDS as anti-Semitic. So you see, you know, we don't know where these, where these developments are tending, right? People can quickly reverse their, their views as we saw in 1967 after Israel won the Six Day War. A very pro-Israel student movement in Germany suddenly within a rapid fire period of time became anti-Israel. So I'm, I'm tend to proceed with great caution and skepticism, but there are encouraging signs. Her, and then we'll go back to you, and then, wait, can we, can we, can we deal with his question and come back to you since he hasn't answered question? Is that okay? Joe, Joe uh, um, he asked, what are the, what's the effectiveness or dangers of um, different anti-Semitic forces in the U.S. and Europe from left wing, from the left wing sector, Islamists and right wing or Nazi, neo-Nazis? Well, I mean, it's um, we just saw what happened in Pittsburgh from from you know from a right wing neo Nazi. We know, we certainly know the dangers, um, and that there's a very interesting uh, article. I would you know suggest people take a look at it from Michael Ledeen, who's a freedom scholar at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He wrote on PJ Media. Um, he's he's an expert in Italian fascism and has written a lot about Iran, and he examined why this in many ways was not, we should not have been ambushed by this attack because of the high, because Jews have been under attack in this country for a long time. In terms of the, you know, the, stati the statistics from the FBI and discrimination was still not too far back, right, in terms of 
elite universities having quotas and all of that, that you know, America's viewed, I know, as a paradise for, um, by American Jews, but it, it wasn't always a paradise, and he points this out. And it's a, it's a very, I think, important um, article on PJ Media from Michael Ledeen. Um, you know, in Europe, clearly, the, the, the danger, it's different. The, the dangers are um, Jews have been killed by, um, only by Islamists, right, over the last um, you know, number of years. The, the main threat to European Jewry um, right now are um, Islamists, you know, European Muslims, uh, re returning uh, Islamic state fighters who come back who have been trained, uh, Hezbollah uh, supporters. In Germany, for example, the German government refuses to ban outlaw all of Hezbollah. There are 950 members um, operating in Germany, ra raising money and recruiting new members. Germany just refuses to outlaw them. Uh, the Americans in Canada and other countries, as I mentioned, uh, have outlawed all of Hezbollah, but um, you have these mosques that are dominated in community centers by Shiite um, um, terrorists, um, one could argue, at least are involved in terror financing. Um, and uh, there's no political will um, on, the, on the part of the Europeans. Um, I, I think the, the, what's happening in Germany right now, and one could argue Germany in general, but Europe, Germany in particular, Germ and Europe in general, this toxic mix of um, um, migrants and some refugees and immigrants who are steeped in Jew hatred, who have been socialized in that climate, combined with the rise of some very far-right parties and sort of general political incompetence is a, is a societal and political recipe for implosion. Um, so that's, uh, that's very troubling. The left-wing anti-Semitism is also very disturbing. There's a politician in uh, Germany from the left party. It's a very large opposition party in the Bundestag. Uh, Christina Buchholz, who supports Hamas and Hezbollah, but she's not, you know, hasn't been ousted in any way, and she's openly defends their resistance against Israel. Um, so you, that's a very dangerous party in, on many levels because they've sent members aboard the, the Gaza flotilla. Um, and then, of course, in the Alternative for Germany party, a far-right party, you've got right-wing extremists who have, you know, played down the Holocaust or uh, Alexander Gowland, one of the main uh, party members, has uh, praised the Wehrmacht, Germany's army, during World War I and World War II. Um, so you've got a, you've got a, a very um, unsavory and nasty climate. Um, but again, the, the, from, my, from my, my departure point, my analysis, I see um, radical Islam as, as the main danger for Jews and Israeli institutions in Europe right now. In terms of, um, and we have the evidence to support it, in terms of the United States, um, it's a different cat here um, because there's, uh, there's less um, um, indifference, societal indifference toward Jews, and Jews, at least according to this recent Pew study I read, it, as an ethnic religious group, are very uh, beloved by Americans. I, I remember seeing a report. So there's, there's more of a, and politicians are much more willing to confront anti-Semitism here in their speeches. Um, you don't see, and this gets to your question, you don't, you don't, but you don't, in, in Europe, you don't see the type of countervailing forces you see in, in the United States against anti-Semitism. Um, I, I think these types of figures in Pittsburgh, uh, Robert, um, what was Bowers. it? Pardon? Bowers. Bowers, thank you. I wasn't trying to pronounce it. That's going to be a real danger and I, um, because you're going to have these sort of, um, you know, right-wing fascists who are animated by lethal anti-Semitism who are not part of a, a larger uh, movement, whereas in Europe you have you have you know you have real Islamic movements or mini movements. So to deal with that um, in the United States, um, you're going to need um, you know enhanced security. In terms of the Israel-related anti-Semitism, you may have problems with um, increased BDS activity in 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 your Congress right now, right, because of the uh, election of two uh, Congresswomen from Minnesota and um, Michigan, who both support BDS. So that's very unsettling from the point of view that you've seen a, a, a bleep now on the bubble 
on the, uh, sort of on the BDS cardiac monitor in Congress where you could actually see s uh, someone or two representatives propose pro-BDS legislation. I'm not sure if it would come to that. Well, sure, she, her, her question was about the demographics in uh, Europe or a statement that, that there will be an increase in um, Muslims that will um, over, 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 or overtake uh, non-Muslim births. I mean, it's, uh, you know, these, are, these are questions for the Europeans to have to deal with. Uh, I recall an anecdote from uh, the, the peerless Middle East scholar Bernard Lewis who passed away uh, this year. Uh, at 101, or he was going to be 101, um, who was asked in an interview after 9-11 by a European reporter, I believe he was a German reporter, um, you know, when Lewis talked about um, um, the spread of, um, or the, the growth of, of um, European Muslim, pop the growth of the European Muslim population in Europe, the reporter asked him, well, what can we do about the, pop the demographic changes? And, Lewis said to him on the phone, uh, have more babies. Um, and, uh, but the reporter never called back, and I don't believe quoted him in the article. Um, so we can end on that note, but uh, thanks for uh, carving out the time to come. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.